Oh, hello you. Welcome to today's edition of the Fast Moving Ghost Caboose. Welcome to all orange gobblers and yogurt pop sniffers. Wipe the yogurt from your nostrils, boys and girls, as we enter the world of psychotic reactions and carburetor dung. Carburetor dung. I don't have a car. I don't know what a carburetor is. But of course, this man did. And he liked to play Lou Reed's metal machine music from his car stereo. I'm guessing using cassette tapes. Anyway, there he is. And we're going to read today his reasonable guide to horrible noise. His reasonable guide to horrible noise from Village Voice 1981. Christgau calls it skronk. I have always opted for the more obvious horrible noise. Guitars and human voices are primary vectors, though just about every other musical instrument has been employed over the years. As well as smashed crockery, e.g. the first Perubu album, Sentimental Journey, scraped garbage can lids and bongolated oil drums, early stooges, not to mention phono cartridges, toothpicks, pipe cleaners, etc. John Cage variations too. You probably can't stand it, but this stuff has its adherence, like me, and aesthetic, if you want to call it that. Look at it this way. There are many here among us for whom the life force is best represented by the living twitching of one tortured nerve, or even a full-scale anxiety attack. I do not subscribe to this point of view 100%, but I understand it, have lived it. Thus the shriek, the caterwaul, the chainsaw, gnarl gnashing, the yowl and the whiz that decapitates may be reheard by the adventurous or emotionally damaged as mellifluous bursts of unarguable affirmation. And one could, if so inclined, take it even further than that. In his essential book, The Tuning of the World, under the heading Sacred Noise and Secular Silence, composer R. Murray Schaefer reports that during the Middle Ages, to which we are after all now returning, quote, a certain type of noise, which we may call sacred noise, was not only absent from the lists, lists of prescripted sounds which societies from time to time drew up, but was, in fact, quite deliberately invoked as a break from, his t from the tedium of tranquility. I want to read a little bit from this book, uh, the Tuning of the World by R. Murray Schaefer. It was written in 1977 and I wanted to read the parts to do with sacred noise. So Jesus's followers heard the word of God, the gods communicated with thunder and earthquakes for example, sacred noise, bells, um, Nowadays, of course, we are punished and penetrated with a noise that R. Murray Schaefer says makes us schizophrenic. The association of clocks and church bells in Western Europe in the 14th century was by no means fortuitous, for Christianity provided the rectilinear idea of the, con excuse me, of the concept of time as progress, albeit spiritual progress, with a starting point, creation, an indicator to Christ and a fateful conclusion, the apocalypse. Time is always running out in the Christian system and the clock bell punctuates the fact. In Greek Orthodox uh, Christianity, um, it is the lowness of the priest's voice which is said to invoke um, God. There's also curious phenomena in industrial Britain or industrialising Britain in the late 1700s when factory owners prevented the workers from singing. It seems a curious symbol of emerging industrial Britain that the song was taken from the lungs and from the mouths of the workers. So to continue with R. Murray Schaefer, the association of noise and power has never really been broken in the human imagination. It descends from God to the priest, to the industrialist, and more recently to the broadcaster and aviator. 
The important thing is to realize is this. To have the sacred noise is not merely to make the biggest noise. Rather, it is a matter of having the authority to make it without censure. Okay, I think that's it from Armo Schaefer. No, it's not. There's one more thing I wanted to read. Continue from R. Murray Schaefer. In the West, the ear gave way to the eye as the most important gatherer of information about the time of the Renaissance with the development of the printing press and perspective painting. One of the most evident testaments of this change is the way in which we have come to imagine God. It was not until the Renaissance that God became portraiture. Previously, he had been conceived of sound he had been conceived as sound or vibration. So, Lester Banks. Lester Banks, instead of asking the holy mystic R. Murray Schaefer from Canada, he's not really a mystic, you know what I mean. He makes one of his bangs kinds of jokes. Or as Hans Shan once also did once advise one of his Zen acolytes in Kyoto in lieu of cane whipping the whelp, if you're feeling uptight and truly would prefer to sail into the mystic, just chug lug two quarts of coffee and throw on side one of the first Clash album, English edition, at 10. Full treble, no bass. Any more koans you need answered, refer them to Wildman Fisher. The point of all this, of course, is that hideous racket is liberating. To go with the flow, as Jerry Brown put it in his book Thoughts, is always a wiser course of action than planting oneself directly in the path of the 7th Avenue Express, itself best portrayed on record by Sister Ray and the first New York Dolls album. I am also firmly convinced that one reason for the popularity of rap music like disco and punk before it is that it's so utterly annoying to those to those of us whose cup of blair it isn't. More than once its fans have walked up to a doorless telephone booth I was occupying, set their mammoth radios down on the sidewalk five inches from my feet and stood there smiling at me. They didn't want to use the phone, but I find it hard to begrudge them such gleeful rudeness. How could I, after walking all over the city with my also highly audible cassette player, emitting free jazz, Metal Machine music, Public Image Limited's theme, Miles Davis's Rated X, and Yanis Anakis's electroacoustic music, part of which the composer described as sound paintings from the bombing of Greece. So fair is fair, even given the differences in taste. Look at the description, I've put most of these musical references up there. Please, go and have a listen. Which also extends into the questions of set and setting. Once I was eating lunch with two friends near St Mark's Place and a familiar sound started coming out of the jukebox. It took me a few seconds to recognise it, but that voice was unmistakable. Hey, I said, it's Lydia and the Jerks doing orphans. One friend laughed. Well, folks, enjoy your meals but she hadn't noticed it till I'd bought, brought it to her attention. And in context, it didn't sound all that more yakety than the Beatles' Helter Skelter, which immediately preceded it. <clears throat> then, of course, there is the whole question of Muzak and whether digestion really is improved by the theme of Dr. Zhivago, or whether heavy metal and punk are essentially the same sound, or disco and punk equally oppressive. But then, when Patti Smith reviewed Velvet Underground Live in 1969 in Cream back in, 60, back in 75, she said she liked it precisely because it was oppressive, with which I at least partially concur. Everybody has their little peculiarities, as evidenced by the fact that some people actually like to listen to the radio. So perhaps I can best bear witness to my own by listing a few of the Gehennas of wretched squall which have made me most aware that I am alive over the years. And here starts Lester Bang's Guide to Noise. Starting with The Stooges, LA Blues, from Funhouse. After assaulting us for half an hour with six songs, including the bulleted bore tenor sax excuse me, of Steve Mackay, 
the Ann Arbor visionaries let their whole thing let the whole thing explode and melt all over itself in this arrhythmic 1970 offering, replete with igneous feedback blankets, Mackay blowing his brains out and disappearing forever, and a man called Pop mewling, snarling, sighing, and licking his paws. The germs forming live. It was all downhill for Darby and Co. after this 1978 debut. They could not yet play the rather standard issue Ram Ramones, Ramones clone headbangisms of their album, so they had to toddle along a guitar and rhythm track that sounded like Malta Mill being trailed from dining room to TV set while Dar puled Burble, whose chorus you could tell he had reached whenever he repeated the words, Pull my finger, I'm bigger than. The third selection by Lester Banks. A taste of DNA. The lead instrument in the new improved DNA is neither Arto Lindsay's slamming and scra scrapings of the electric 12-string guitar he never plays chords on, nor his laconically imploding epiglottis. It is Tim Wright's bass, which ain't even bereft of melody. And Iku Mori cut Sonny Murray in my book. Sure wish Ayla was alive to play with these folks. Don't laugh, Ornette almost played on Radio Ethiopia. He played Skronk. The word sounds like something straight from his bell, if anybody ever did. The Sounds of the Junkyard on Folkways. Recorded live, of course, and quite a bit more soothing than you would expect. Though with titles like Burning Out an Old Car, You Know It Can't Miss. This is a really good album, really, really worth listening to. It's called The Sounds of the Junkyard. Yoko Ono. Don't worry, Kyoto, Mummy's only looking for a hand in the snow. Flip of John's Cold Turkey single and side two of Life Peace in Toronto. Also pretty good fun. Interesting not only for John's churning blues under feedback guitar riff and how far ahead of her time Yoko was vocally, though Dig Paddy Waters' Black is the Colour on ESP disc in the early 60s, but for brief lyrical correspondence with Lydia Lunch's Orphans, featured on Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, which is a migraine EP on, uh, from 1980. If, as Chris Gow says, Arto is the king of skrunk, then Lydia's sly guitar work certainly qualifies her as queen. Guys in my sixth grade, sixth grade neighbourhood used to entertain themselves by tying the head of a cat to one hot rod fender and its tail to another and driving the cars apart slowly, which sounded a lot like a lot like a lot like part of this. Unless it's for Catholic school beatings by nuns, nostalgia doesn't account for Lydia's passionate baby doll wailing. If you only want to try one, make it this. Nothing more deathly shrill has ever been recorded. Jad Flair, the zombies of Moratau. Jad is half of half Japanese, while with his brother David made a half J three record set that I still haven't been able to listen to all the way through. A previous EP containing such highlights as School of Love was great, but this might, might even be better for the way that Jad integrates a tonal air raid guitar with sub Jonathan Richmond White Berber infantilismus vocals that, as they natter tune, tunelessly onward, actually tell little stories. He's quoting here, and I said, Dr. Frankenstein, you must die, and I shot him. End quote. And you hear the gun, Kablu. This may be a whole new songwriting genre, or at least one terminal of the Lou Reed. I walked to the chair. Then I sat in it. School of Lyrics. Lou Reed, Metal Machine Music. Don't see this around much anymore, but it surely it sure caused a ruckus when he sprang it on Transformer, Sally Can't Dance, Rocky Horror fans. A two record, hour long set of shrieking feedback run through various pieces of high tech equipment sounded great in Midwestern suburbs, but kind of unnecessary in New York City. There's a theory 
Metal Machine Music is a joke, a way of him getting out of his contract with, I think, RCA, his record label. This is nonsense. Lou Reed is always stuck by Metal, metal Machine Music. Uh, 24 years later, I think it was in 2000, he it made a reissue, or um, how do you say, a remastering of Metal Machine Music, and then he toured with his Metal Machine Trio. So he believed every note of that record. Also, Lou Reed didn't care about how you listen to it. It reminds me of Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. You can start wherever you want. You can listen to it in any form you find comfortable. However, in Guattari and Deleuze's book, you're supposed to read the introduction and conclusion, and then do whatever you like. Go from any part of the uh, text. This is a surprising one. Blue Cheer Vincibus Eruptum. These guys may well have been the first true heavy metal band, but what counts here is not whether Lay Stevens or Lee Stevens birthed that macho grunt before Mark Farner, both stole it from Hendrix, but that Stevens' sub-sub-sub-sub-Hendrix guitar overdubs stumbled around each other so ineptly they verged on a truly bracing atonality. The harshest entrance and the last one here is... Worth hearing just for how grim and dusty and disgusting this whole record oozes. It's called The Mars EP from Infidelity in 1980. With Teenage Jesus, DNA and The Contortions, this group was featured on the watershed No New York LP. You mean you don't own a copy? What are you, sick or something? But for my money, this piece of beyond lyrics, often beyond discernible instrumentation, psychotic noise, is their absolute masterpiece. Despite John Gavanti, this is horrid, absolutely vile. Definitely listen to it. It's in the description. John Gavanti, their version of Mozart's John Don Giovanni, which I have never been able to listen to all the way through. This is not industrial, but human music. And so what if said humans sound like they're in a bad way? You are too. As it grinds and grieves and grovels, you cannot deny that, cer that they certainly plough what they sow. Best cut, scorn. Best rumour, somebody dropped the original tapes produced by Arthur Lindsay in water and accidentally at that.